Hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about Karl Popper's short essay titled The Conspiracy Theory of Society, which is super important for anyone interested in conspiracy theory research. Now originally I was going to finish off this uh, Christian year with some episodes on Foucault's lectures at the Collège de France, but actually I'm going to push those back. So I'm going to do this episode today on Karl Popper's The Conspiracy Theory of Society. Next week I'm going to do Richard Hofstadter's The Paranoid Style in American Politics, which is another super important essay in the realm of conspiracy theory research. Then I'm going to take a two-week break. I'm mentioning this early, so you know, in case you wonder why I disappear. I'm going to take a couple weeks off and then come back with some fresh stuff on Foucault's lectures at the Collège de France. So. If you're new here, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, you can like, share, subscribe, see 300 episodes I already have up if you're checking this out on YouTube. If you found this in a podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video for it on YouTube. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find the audio on its own on pretty much any podcast platform under all the same names. You can follow me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or uh, you can follow me on Twitter at David Guineo. There are links for all these things in the description. If you want to help me out, do all those things I just mentioned. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. Take care of yourselves first. And yeah, let's jump into this super short yet important essay in the realm of conspiracy theory research. So Popper begins by identifying that among some rationalists, as he calls them, there is a tendency to believe that the world can be reduced to a few powerful actors and many very broad historical events can be reduced to powerful actors who are subtly, maybe not so subtly, pulling the strings behind various events. And he says that this isn't new. He says that it is very much a kind of theism, which is kind of a, a belief in God. Specifically, he suggests that this is tantamount to the ways in which the Greeks tried to understand events in their time, where they believed that events that befell them were the product of the gods' own will, their own desire to conspire, to have certain events unfold in the way that they wanted them to unfold. And so people would resort to explaining these events by suggesting that it was these powerful figures, these gods who were working together to achieve some end. And we suggest that we have what we have done at this time, and he'd written this in the mid 20th century, closer to the 60s and 62, I think. He's suggesting that in a world that has left theism, you know, ostensibly, in favor of secularism, we have replaced gods with powerful human actors. So instead of saying it is the gods that are conspiring against us, that have all this power and doing all this stuff to screw us over, we're saying that it's these group of people who can be easily identified in the material world. Now he calls this the conspiracy theory of society, to reduce very complicated societal events to very easily digestible explanations that they're just, you know, these people calling the shots and that's it. It's a way to get around engaging with these more complicated issues. And the effects of this obviously are widespread. I mean, the effects of conspiracy theories on the general public have been documented just to an incredible extent. But he pays specific attention to the way in which conspiracy theorists historically have used conspiracy theories to gain power and to stoke fear and hatred among their voters, among their constituents. So in the example of like Adolf Hitler, who used the conspiracy theories peddled in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is all fake, which is all incorrect, he used these to proffer his own conspiracy to effectively conceal the fact that he himself was trying to organize a conspiracy in his own efforts to overthrow the German government. And there's a lot of historical precedence for this, that is using conspiracy theories to call out conspirators, to say that there are these people doing these bad things, all the while distracting from the fact that you yourself are trying to engage in, in a conspiracy, trying to reach or attain some end, and you've just deflected blame onto someone else. You've distracted everyone into thinking that it is this other group, which are often marginalized people, like historically Jewish people, marginalized people who have been targets 
of these conspiracy theories. Now to submit to these ideas, to say that they're just like conspirators acting behind the scenes, is to fall short in conducting what Popper believes to be proper social theory, at least engaging in proper social theory. And that is because like in the case of Hitler, Hitler's plans obviously failed. Uh, not of course after having been unsuccessful at committing genocide against millions of Jewish people, including other communities. But it failed at the end, not because Popper says that there were just other people conspiring against him, where there, there, it's as though society just unfolds with varying conspiring groups going up against one another. It failed because there were unintended consequences that produced the conditions for it to fail. And this signals for Popper that the conspiracy theory of, the, of society, the idea that you can reduce very complicated ideas to there just being these conspirators, fails to account for all of these other factors. And it is just apparent in the ways that conspirators have often failed at doing what they've tried to do. Not because there are these, these other conspirators trying to undermine them, but just because society is very complex. And if we ignore these other factors, we are going to be very limited in understanding society and understanding many of its different factors, many of the different operations at work within it. So to illustrate this as clearly as he can, he gives the example of two people in a small town, one of whom wants to sell their house, and one of, one of whom tried to sell their house, uh, tried to buy a house earlier. And in this case, where somebody was trying to buy a house but there were no houses available, the prices of the houses were probably going to be higher than in the case where there was a potential seller. And this is a very simple example, but his point is to say that the person trying to sell their house is not conspiring to reduce the market value of houses. Because as soon as you know people start to put their houses on the market, the value of them is going to come down because suddenly the demand is being met with a supply, that, or maybe the other way around. The supply is going to bring down the demand, which is going to bring down the cost. And this doesn't mean that people are deliberately working in such a way as to disenfranchise others, to get a better price on their house. It's just the way the market works in a capitalist economy, that, you know, according to supply and demand. And we can very much, we can easily overlook that if we were to try and say that the market is going to be dictated by conspirators trying to deliberately undermine certain people try to undermine large swaths of the population when it, that's really just how the market works, plus there being a number of other factors, but we lose that if we just focus on the specific intentful actions of individuals and conspirators. Now as far as what the social sciences are supposed to do according to Popper, their real concern is not necessarily with the intent of people, but rather with understanding and avoiding events that people do not want, like war, like famine, like poverty. The social sciences is concerned with addressing these issues. And if these issues are reduced to conspirators and their intentions, Popper thinks that we are completely missing the mark with what the social sciences should be doing. And of course, like Popper is not pretending as though real conspirators haven't produced real consequences in the world, like with Hitler, like we've already talked about or with Lenin in uh, Soviet Russia, or leading up to it, or within Soviet Russia. These were real conspiracies that were conducted that had very negative consequences, some positive ones, but very negative ones, largely, and we can explain them for those reasons. But they were also motivated by a number of other factors, and these people, like Lenin, like Hitler, believing that there were other conspiracies that they needed to combat against that motivated their own conspiracy. So if we didn't have this conspiracy belief in the first place, belief in conspiracy theories, then we can ask whether or not these events would have actually taken place in the end. And that pretty well covers it. If there's anything I excluded, anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. And I should be clear, like, even though Popper's text here is one of the first that deals with the conspiracy theory and really interrogates it, there are examples before this. Hannah Arendt writes about it, Theodore Adorno, among others, even in, you know, you can find examples in Marx. It goes all the way back to the Bible, really. I mean, I could save that for another time, but, you know, conspiracy theories and 
study of conspiracy theories goes back a very long time. And yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. Uh, if you listen to this on a podcast platform and you can leave a review, that would help me out a lot. Leave a good one if you like what I did or a bad one if you didn't like what I did. That'll determine how I feel that day. And yeah, on that note, take care. <laughs>